So greetings to you all this afternoon in the wonderful name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know it's a time after lunch and that's why they have handed it over to me. So we are here in the presence of the Lord this afternoon and it's such a joy to see friends like you from Bangalore and around. You know, as I begin my session today, uh, one of the most interesting verses in the Bible is from the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. If anybody's got a Bible, I would request you to just read that aloud. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 10, it says, You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he had prepared well in advance for you to do. That means each one of us here, what a beautiful testimony that we just heard. Each of us seated here, you're God's workmanship, which means you belong to the brand Jesus. And I thank God for that beautiful word from the Bible. People who speak to you, people who see you, people who just interact with you, have to have that experience called Jesus. And that's the very purpose why we are here on a forum like this today, to come into the presence of the Lord and then tell him, God, give me the grace to see something beyond what I cannot see. Probably session three, which I'm, I've been told to take, I mean, the, the, the probably the caption or the title or whatever you want to call it is, the end purpose of your role and how your heart appears before God. I mean, in spite of all the corporate roles and professions that we play, there is a reason why God has placed us wherever we are in whichever place. I mean, when you, when you see that slide up there, it says from the role to the heart. Because God is a God who provided you that role but when you execute that role, God is not going to look at your role. He's going to look at your heart. And that's from my experience, I'm telling you. I mean, that's why I told sister, please don't introduce all, all those things behind a man. Because like Apostle Paul said, they are all nothing but a piece of rubbish. Before the grace of knowing the surpassing greatness of the Lord that we serve. And this afternoon when I stand before you, probably the greatest experience in life is when you go and stand on your knees at the foot of the master to say, God, please be more real than my reality. Holy Spirit, would you kindly be more real than the reality around me? That, I think, is what matters. So if you look at that slide up there, it is to be able to focus into that little ring down there, which you possibly can hold through your two little fingers. Probably that's what is the way in which God looks at the minute details of our heart, our thought, our deeds, and our words. And that's why he said, you are his workmanship. And you've been created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 139 and verse number 16, it goes like this. Even before one of your organs came to be, every day ordained for you were written in his book. That means your days were ordained and written in his book even before your father and mother even thought about you. That's why we have such beautiful testimonies here to say, how does the Lord lead us forward? And what is the very purpose with which he's called us forward? You know, when you look at the next slide that is up there, a role too important is what each one of us hold, that you've got to be ready to look beyond what you can actually see. You know, in English, there's a beautiful phrase which says, what your mind does not know, your eyes cannot see. I repeat, what your mind does not know, your eyes cannot see. I mean, it, it depends on how much of an information that you feed to your mind that you're able to see things. That's why a doctor can see things differently. A software engineer can see things differently. A driver, an auto driver on the road can see much different than all of us. There is beauty in the way that they look at things. You know, they're like this afternoon, the cab driver driving me in here, I said, there is a session in the afternoon, you're already late. He said, sir, don't worry. <laughs> Something which I couldn't say. <laughs> so I was just listening to his answer. He said, sir, don't worry, I'll be there. And I think he bought me bang on time. But I mean, nice of him to at least put that word. I felt so good about what he said because then he said, I'm comfortable. Now it's your problem. <laughs> That's how God looks at us. He says, just, just pass it on to me and don't worry. You know, you're quite okay to be in my hands. And that's why I've created you. And I've already prepared in advance what you should be doing. That means my dear brothers and sisters in this room, Whatever be the profession you hold, whichever be the organization or city that you are in, one thing is clear. God is predestined and preordained what you are going to do. And this day we are here to acknowledge and to look back deeper into ourselves to understand how much of that God's role do I really perceive and understand? And is my focus rightfully placed that I see what God prepared in advance for me? 
if that can be the alignment with which we stand, you know, Apostle Paul's biodata, which I usually call it because all these international Bible studies that I do, people ask me, whose biodata do you like the best in the Bible? I said, Apostle Paul. They said, why? Because you know how his CV goes? I was stoned. I was hungry. I was naked. I was thrown in prison. I was rejected by brethren and false brethren. I went through shipwreck and I went through everything else that this world can throw at me. There was nothing great for him to write home about, but he's probably the greatest man because of whom we have the New Testament with us today. And I give glory to God for such testimonies. And brothers and sisters, if anybody seated here in this room today has got reasons for failures, has got reasons for downtimes, and any of you have reasons to say, I mean, it's not been the best with me. Praise God for you because that's the beauty with which the Lord works. I give glory to God. I mean, if we can only be able to grow to be people who can thank God, God, I just thank you for my failures. I thank you for my infirmities, Lord. I thank you for the places that I was insulted, Lord. There's nothing great for me to write home about. And God, thank you for keeping me that unwanted fellow, but still giving me your grace. You know, that would be the most noble praise and worthy honor that you can give to your God. More than any great blessings that we can actually boast about. So this afternoon, when we are in the presence of the Lord, can we look at the deeper role that God has given us? The deeper role of being wherever you are. It's not your problem on the job that matters. It's not the problem with your boss or colleagues that matter. It's not the culture. It's not the organizational culture. It's not about the ethics, about what corporate culture carries. It's where God has placed you in the midst of that culture and what God expected you to do in that place. That's all that matters, brother. If a Paul and a Silas can worship midnight in a prison, tied by chains, with no light around, and they, I mean, if you read that chapter there, the previous day, their clothes were torn, they were dragged on the street, they were accused of what they didn't do, and they go there and they worship and praise the Lord as if nothing happened. You know, the most beautiful part I love about Apostle Peter is, he is standing among 16 soldiers thrown in a prison by Herod. With two chains and the angel of the Lord comes into the prison and taps, Hey, Peter, Peter, get up, man. And you know where the Bible beautifully describes it? Next day morning, after the feast of the Passover, Herod was supposed to call him to be executed. And I look at this Peter and he's sleeping, it seems. My dear brothers and sisters, with two chains in his hand, 16 soldiers guarding him, and our man is fast asleep. <laughs> That's called the trusting your God beyond your circumstances. Hallelujah. I give glory to God for such, such testimonies from the Bible that we see. Would I sleep in a prison if I were put in a similar position? Definitely no. Be more anxious. And you know what happened? The angel of the Lord wakes him up, tells him, put on your sandals, put on your clothes. Like how you tell a baby to do? Because he's really sleeping. Put on your clothes, put on your sandals, and then makes him stand up and they open and they go through gate one and gate two. And they say the iron gate opened for them on its own. But Peter went out there, the angel left him, and he went to the house where people were praying for his release. And he knocks at the door, the servant girl called Rhoda comes, and did she open the door? <laughs> That means, my dear Peter, the iron door will open for you. <laughs> but Peter, you are Peter, the small door, please wait. This is what we are, my dear brothers and sisters. Just because there's a great miracle that happened in our life, just because a provision of God happened in one area, don't forget who you are. Peter, the iron door opened, the angel brought you out, but now Peter, stand knocking, nothing will happen. My dear brothers and sisters, we got to learn. Where God put us and why he does something sometimes, that is to understand the divine nature and the will of God. Just because he put you in that great organization, in that great position with a great team, doesn't mean everything is okay. When you are in that organization and in that great team, can you just recollect those moments where you thought, oh, this is not as good as I thought it is. When you went in, there were those blocks, the doors that didn't open. And you gave a great testimony last week, <laughs> stating that, oh, I, my God opened a wonderful door for me. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Next week you are stuck and you can't tell it outside. Amen. If you've had that experience, lift your hand and give a big praise to God. I've had it. But this is, <laughs> when you testify out of church and walk out, you get the kicking outside there. That is reality of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, when I go to a church and preach, my wife will tell me, wait, this week you had it. <laughs> Ditto, just as she said, I'll get it nice. She said, now you're okay. So next week, decide what to preach. <laughs> you know, what you preach in your life has got to have an absolute connection. Otherwise, people can say, Saji Abraham talks so well. 
and it's nice to listen to him but there will be no connect between his life and the preaching that he did my dear brothers and sisters to have a connection with god and then to preach from his word is the reality of living hallelujah i give glory to god for that because he has given us the grace to walk the talk the way that we we are expected to be can you see this slide i want you to read it on your own i'm not going to read it for you for a while god will wreck your plan when he knows that your plans are about to wreck you my dear brothers and sisters in this hall this is a little difficult slide to understand and i've quoted a reference the luke chapter 5 verses 3 to 6 a very well known portion in the bible please open your bibles to that portion if you have it because that is where the basis of our discussion today is the disciples went all night and they were fishing and in the morning they all come back and we all know how many fishes they caught how many nothing, nothing. beautiful word in the bible they caught nothing you had your boat you had your net you had your team with you and you came back after all your experience and eligibility and years of knowledge about the sea you went fishing the whole night and came back in the morning with nothing my dear brother can i ask you one question who went fishing the disciple of the lord jesus christ huh? even if you are the disciple of the lord jesus you can fail and become a nothing and become an absolute zero with no performance at all and i want you to take a clue from here the disciples went the whole night and came you know one day while i was in my prayer i went on my knees and the lord gave me this portion to read and he said saji abraham i want you to see in sequence you know and the next morning the lord jesus comes there and he wants to preach to the people and he finds two boats out there he gets into one of them which is simon peter's boat and the lord jesus tells simon will you just move that boat a little bit because i need to preach to the people he is least bothered whether his disciple got one fish or not and in that place you see one more verse which mentions you know he found these two empty boats and the people were not there the boats were empty the guys were washing their nets that means they had dirty nets without even catching one fish My dear brother says in the profession that you are in you can try what you want you can do what you want you can dirty yourself but you'll have no result you can come and pray every day in church you can read the bible 10 hours a day you can fast and pray and do what you want and call yourself a christian you can talk in tongues and you can have the anointing that nobody has and yet you will be a non performer a disciple that walked with the lord jesus got nothing you know when i spent my time in prayer and i said holy spirit would you please give me an insight into what is happening here with the disciples why is it that they couldn't catch anything because probably for peter and his team that was the worst day of their life that they caught nothing you know that's when the holy spirit started teaching me he said saji abraham i want you to know the master who created the ocean and created the fishes knew where to hold the fishes that night when these guys were fishing and he knew very well that they're going to come back with nothing and that's why jesus deliberately asked him that question how many fishes did you catch i mean and then peter says master we tried toiled all night and caught nothing that nothing is what jesus wants you to declare throw your pride away let your failures be brought before him and say open heartedly i submit lord jesus that in my effort with my experience with my infrastructure and with the facilities and provisions that i have god i could achieve nothing and i stand as an empty vessel and then jesus tells him to push out into the deep and just lower your net and you know the scientific knowledge the technology and all the experience they know no fish will come in that place that he tells me to put the net if i knew that it was there why would i be fishing in the sea all night all these years i have never found fish there that is why we go into the sea and jesus says just put it there and as we all read in the bible it says they caught so much of fish that their nets were about to tear they filled the two boats and then they call the other boats with somebody read luke chapter 5 and verse number 8 please can somebody read the eighth verse to me the eighth verse when simon peter saw this he fell at jesus feet and said ha ha see when he got all the fish when his boat is full and when everybody's boat is full till then simon peter had no problem when he saw this happening go away from me jesus i now got my fish i don't need you anymore no that's not what it means my dear brothers and sisters in verse 8 go away from me master i am a sinner the acknowledgement before the master when he when you see the abundance with which he can bless you when you see that he can transform your failure your zero your nothing into an overflowing abundance remember you are unworthy to stand before the master 
That's the kind of realization that gives us. That means Christian brothers and sisters, if you're employed in the corporate place, where many others employed along with you do not know the Lord Jesus, but you are his workmanship there. This is the attitude Christ would like you and me to put forward. Not to say that I've achieved something great like everybody else, but to come to his feet and say, Master, I'm not even worthy to stand in your presence, Lord. Thank you for these blessings. That would be the real wholehearted thankfulness that we can express to our Lord. Father, when I know your greatness, when I know your loveliness, when I see your grace upon me and your favor, I know that you're such a loving God. But Father, before your holiness, I'm not even worthy to stand before you. But I thank you for this grace. Dear brothers and sisters, you know after that, after verse number 8, if you jump to verse number 11, brother, can you read verse number 11? So when they finished collecting all the fishes and brought their boats to the land, they forsook everything. They left all the boat, the fish, the net, everything what they toiled for and they followed him. My dear brother, that's all life is all about. And that's why Luke chapter 5 gives us this portion, not to say Peter got a great catch of fish, not to say that the Lord Jesus gave him a great miracle to catch some fish that day. No, brother. I want you to understand the specific point that they forsook that boat and that fishes and the net and the miracle that happened there because that did not mean anything to them before the surpassing greatness of following the master who wanted them to be with him. Hallelujah. This afternoon, dear brothers and sisters in this room, I want to ask you, would your career be greater than following your master? Would the achievements on that career for you be a much more important reason to achieve in life and praise God for than to leave that aside and follow the master? Your achievements will follow, brother. Hallelujah. Wherever you're a zero, wherever you're a failure, your God will fill your boat and you will fill others' boats. You'll be a blessing to many around you that you never imagined. But when you see blessings happening because of you, remember one thing, leave the blessings and follow the master. That is the calling that for us, that God is placing before us today. Because you know, very often ordinary people that we are, that we tend to follow the blessings and think that I'm greater than somebody else, that I'm better than somebody else. You know, the Bible says, consider one another better than you. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3, it says, do nothing out of selfishness or of vain conceit, but in humility consider one another better than yourself. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, as we sit here today in this Christian professional conference for the day, how many of us in this room would be humble enough to consider everybody else here as better than you? As I speak from here this afternoon, the Lord Jesus teaches me that I better consider everybody in this room who's listening to me to be better than me. If I don't do that, I don't align with the will of God according to Philippians 2.3. And that's the lesson he teaches us. As you grow the corporate ladder, as God enables you to use your talents, abilities and your, you know, all the kind of wisdom and knowledge that he imparts to you, you being a special person in the team and when God's blessing flows through you and you be the channel of that grace and you have testimonies to tell people to encourage them, at the same time, remember, consider yourself much lower than the others around you. That means if I go according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it tells me just one beautiful message. Saji Abraham, do nothing out of selfish and ambition or of vain conceit but in humility consider everybody else that means any other human being existing on the face of the earth I need to consider that they are better than me my dear brothers and sisters if I have an attitude to judge somebody if I have an attitude to feel that I'm somewhere better than somebody that means I'm misaligning from the will of God and Ephesians 2 10 as we read said you are God's workmanship if you are God's workmanship it's got to show and this afternoon, brothers and sisters, one question that I would like to leave with you is, are you somebody who's got that attitude to say, Father God, everybody else is better than me? You know, I'll show you one small exercise right now in this room. Would you look at the person sitting next to you, shake his or her hand and say, you are better than me? Can you just try doing that? Just do that. Say you're better than me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. That's lovely. Can you see a smile on your face that you didn't know? <laughs> Everybody's got the broadest smile ever. You know why? The reality is psychologically it is saying, hey, he told me to tell. Don't think it's a real. <laughs> this is not from my heart because he said you heard it. So I'm telling you that. And that's the subconscious attitude with which most of us know this is not true. And yet we wished each other because Haji Abraham said, because he shouldn't call me up separately. Why didn't you say this? So I better say this. My dear brothers and sisters, that smile is proof of the fact that we don't have it in us to say that. That's what it means. 
And today it's a, it's a litmus test of who we are before God's presence. If I genuinely can look at another person and say, brother, sister, you're better than me, I wouldn't smile. It wouldn't put a smile on my face. That would be done with utmost seriousness because it is not a joke. But right now what we did was a joke. And that was a nice joke. But today, this conference here is the call of God into your life and into my life to ensure that this thing that we consider as a joke should never be so in our lifetime again. Dear brothers and sisters, let's be extremely careful because we are people with limited knowledge, limited understanding, however great you've grown in the corridors of career. Because, you know, I speak in many universities and colleges. I went to the IIT Delhi and I had a conference with the professors there. And, you know, this was the Department of Mathematics, Bioinformatics and all sorts of things that do with numbers, which I don't like. So I was there, and I was speaking to them, and then the Lord gave me the wisdom. The Lord said, Kisaji, can you ask them three questions? I said, yes, Lord, and he told me what the three questions to ask are. And I'm going to ask that question in this room today. I hope you're all well-educated, well-experienced, people who love mathematics, because I'm going to ask you a question for mathematics. Now, how many of you are ready? Okay. <laughs> I don't like that subject, definitely no. But thank you, all of you who don't like mathematics, I'm your friend. Now, today... <laughs> So I'm going to ask you three questions. Just give me a quick answer. They look like stupid questions, but they're nice questions. So my first question to you is shout out the answer the moment you know it. Huh? Okay, here's my first question. How many fingers in one hand? Five. Fantastic. You know Max. <laughs> How many in two hands? How many in ten hands? Hun, 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 hun. Ha ha, no, no. How many in ten hands? Ten into five is how much? So how many of you said 100 here? All of you who said 100, don't worry, you're absolutely normal. If there is somebody who said a 50, get a brain scan done, you're something wrong with you. Because a normal man cannot say 50, will say 100. My dear brother, sister, it's not for the fun of it, but I want you to know, we are basic human beings who don't even have the logical sense to calculate how many fingers in 10 hands. And then we think we are great human beings. How wonderful, no? That's what we are. I just quoted this example for you to understand the limitations with which we have. That's why the Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, you who don't know how to count even fingers in ten hands, consider the other person better than you. Is it okay now? <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, this is beautiful learning. Because you know that every professor in IIT got it wrong. But there is one problem with this question. This day, only Saji Abraham has the beautiful opportunity of making you do this mistake. Never again, nobody else can let you do it now. It's over. You will only do it once in a lifetime. But you have an opportunity. Go home today and try it. That will be your opportunity. It works just once, huh? because I've tried it out. You can never repeat this again. Because our mind has already registered it. This day, let me tell you, the Lord Jesus, he knows the limitations that we are. He knows that we are nothing. He knows a pizza, man, you can't even catch a fish in the night if I don't decide to give it to you. Hey, Peter. But the same Peter, you can sleep well in the midst of soldiers. It doesn't matter to you what might happen to you tomorrow. Dear brother, dear sister, if you can really submit into the hand of the Lord, the career and the progression that you are handling right now, wherever has God has placed you, just submit and say, Father God, I consider everybody else better than me, even the one who abuses me, even the one who's not good to me. Father God, before you, I surrender with a wholehearted attitude to say, that person I will consider better, and through that I honor you, my God. That would be the greatest noble attitude. That's why I said you've got, you got to look beyond what you can see. A role too important for you to see that don't look at the physical role that you are in. You've got to look beyond that, dearest brothers and sisters. And that is Christian walk. To look beyond the reality. And that's when God can wreck your plans. He didn't want the disciples to catch a single fish. He made the fishes be parked somewhere else that night. And next morning he comes and says, I'll give you the fish. If you come and surrender to the master, you will get what you want in abundance. But remember, when you get in abundance, he will also give you a realization that you're not worthy to stand before him. And when that realization comes and you might leave your net and the fishes that you prayed for, wanted and slogged for, and then you will follow him. If that can be the experience with which we can follow Christ, Christ, it's meaningful to live for this God. 
Amen. That's the beauty with which he stands. You know this world, many people about change management, they all know this sister was quoting this testimony. Woke our world that we live in volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. This has become even more highlighted after the COVID phase. Everything that you see around you is volatile. There is no proper sense of clarity in any profession. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. This is actually, you can go and Google it and see. Like she said, search about Saji Abraham. Instead of all that, you do this. So, VUCA is a terminology used by the American army when they were fighting the Russian army on unknown territory. And VUCA is a terminology that they, there is a technology that they used to work their logic together to fight in an unknown territory. And this day, management concept of VUCA is being used across the world today because post-COVID uncertainties that affect your business, that affect your role, that affect your career, various things have come across. So VUCA is one thing that is actually taking place. And in Christian parlance, you and I have been called to put our faith and trust in God to actually address this VUCA which happens the world around. Children of God, you and I have something divine, a provision which is so divine that the world doesn't know where to find it from. And that's why God has placed you and me wherever you and I are. To be the solution providers to those people where divine wisdom will intervene and provide it for you. To give such answers and solutions to the teams, to the organization, to the kind of ideas that needs to be generated within an organization to be competitive and be leading edge the world over. And that's where God wants his children to rise up. That means Christian at the workplace has got to be a person with a difference. Christian at the workplace needs to consider failure and be thankful to God for that failure. Never complain. Christian at the workplace needs to look at abundance of success and still be consistent in God's presence. Don't jump up. Just say, thank you, Lord, for the abundance. Christian at the workplace be somebody who considers others better than you. And when that is you, when that is your walk with Christ, things change. You know, the next slide that you see is this beautiful tea field. This is the estate where I was. It belongs to Unilever. The Brookborn teas that you drink comes from here. And when I was the director of this plantation, this was the view from my bungalow window, one of the bedrooms. So this is a view I used to get every day. And that's why I read, everything beautiful has a price that you've got to pay. My dear brothers and sisters, if Christ paid the price for us on the cross, and Christ has released you and me into this society in the corporate world. There is a beauty that he wants to impart to the people who would otherwise never see it. Just like sister concluded her testimony, sometimes you are the only gospel that they may be reading. And if that's the case, it needs to show. If I am a child of God, it better show. You know why the Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 12, and this is one verse that the Holy Spirit gave me, brother or sister, somebody, can you please read that please? Matthew chapter 12 and the very last verse of that chapter, verse number 50. It says, if you do the will of God the Father, it says who you are. Yeah, one of you can read it out. For whoever does the will of my Father, my Father in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister and my mother. My dearest brothers and sisters seated in this room, the Lord Jesus said, if you are somebody who's doing the will of his father in heaven, he considers you equivalent of being Jesus' sister, Jesus' brother, and Jesus' mother. And this, this afternoon, as we sit in this conference room, let me ask you one thing. Have you lived enough to portray your life and look back and then say, yes, brother, I know Jesus is my brother. And I would love to be the brother of Jesus. If you are the brother of Jesus, it's got to show. If you are the sister of Jesus, it's got to show. If you are the mother of Jesus, it's got to show, brother. Because that family has a character which is different from mine. My brother has a character that's different from mine. You know what his character is? He goes up on the cross when everybody's insulting, abusing, beating. And telling him, if you are the king of the Jews, come down, come down and show us that you are the great man that you said that you are. He goes like a sheep to the shearer as we all read in the Bible. And the first word on the cross is, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He considered everybody else better than him, brother, sister. And this afternoon, that's what God expects you and me to do. A day will come when we stand before him. You've got to be where he wants you to be. And if you can be the person that can be that way, then it makes a difference. And then you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. You know why? If you've got to be somebody different, then there is a character that he expects out of you and out of me. And that character is what is portrayed through the profession that God gives us. You look at the next slide, the field of excellence. This is the cardamom field uh, uh, we had in our estate and that is the beautiful cardamom. Does anybody have this kind of green cardamom anywhere in your house or in your history? Have you ever bought something like this? I know you will not have. The reason being, this is the world's best cardamom. 
for which we got the award from the Spices Board of India and I received that award. And let me tell you how this came. There was a learning from the Bible for me from Psalm 148. You can go home and read. They say, can you please explain to us how you managed to make this kind of a cardamom which none of us could. <laughs> if only I knew what it was, I would have said. <laughs> so you see in a corporate forum, you can't go and say, I prayed touching the plant and all this. It never invite this fellow again. It's not misfit. So I couldn't say all that. So I went there and I spoke about how beautifully the fields were maintained, all the technical stuff that you usually talk in that place because you have to show that you have some knowledge. So I did all that and that I went through this and did this, did that, we did this lab analysis. So I mugged up all those words, those technical terminologies, just to give them an impression that way. And after all that, finally, one of the uh, cardamom importers, I mean, he got up and he said, we know all this what you say. These are all stuff that we've heard time and again. There is something else that you did. Then the Spices Board chairman, he's the IAS officer, he came up and said, Mr. Saji, you're hiding something. And I would like you to please gracefully tell us what it is because we are also eager because India would like to produce better cardamom. And if you can share your idea, our country, it will be a pride to a country. I said, I certainly will. I have a single statement to make on a public stage, but I had to do that. I had to acknowledge. That's why the Bible says, if you are ashamed to acknowledge me before men, I will also be ashamed to acknowledge you before my father. The Lord reminded me that he said, Saji, this is your time, better do it. And I was able to do that by the grace of God and not because of who I am. As a person, me, I cannot. But the Lord enabled me. And that was the beautiful day. That day after the conference, the Spices Board chairman was traveling on the same flight with me. Those days you had jet airways. So Mumbai to Bangalore, we were traveling. And fortunately or unfortunately, his seat was next to mine. So as we traveled together, he said, Saji, you said God did something and all that. Can you tell? You know, my journey with him, it's about one and a half hours to Bangalore. So in that one and a half hours, I could speak a lot about cardamom. And we forgot cardamom. And I was talking about the grace of God, the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the greatness with which the Almighty God can lead us forward. You know, by the time we reached Bangalore, he was touched. He said, would you come home one day? I went to his house in Bangalore. I met with him. He has accepted the Lord as his personal savior and I give all glory and praise. Task us. What matters is have you got an attitude to submit the provided task for the glory of God. That's what matters. And that's the feeling of excellence, brother. It's not making that kind of a cardamom. My wife asked me, I mean, can you get me some more cardamom like this? I said, only if I knew how to make it. But even today, the Lord's grace is there to provide the best for his children. Are you prepared for this kind of a disruption in your place of work? My dear brother, disruption doesn't mean only negative things. Disruption means abundance. Peter's life was disrupted with too many fish that he got. From the point at which he got nothing to a point at which there was overflowing. That is called disruption. Anybody in this room has got abundance of blessing and you have a testimony of God's overflowing blessing in your life. Let me tell you, you are the disruptive leader that God wants in that place. And that's why he's providing that to you. Your blessing in abundance is not to write home your story, brother. Your blessing in abundance is to tell the story of Jesus to the people around you. And that's why God's provisions in life comes in. Are you ready for that disruption? My dear brothers and sisters, what we call as 10x leadership, I don't know why that black square is there. I mean, otherwise I could show you the whole screen. The 10x leadership that the world looks for is fanatic discipline, empiric creativity and productive paranoia. This is what we need. As a Christian, as a child of God, we got to display these characteristics. Empirical creativity. You will be more creative than anybody around you because the world around you cannot display what you have. Your God will embed in you. Your God will provide for your knowledge that you yourself never know. That's why Saji Abraham did not know how to make good cardamom. It's the knowledge of God. And dearest brothers and sisters, productive paranoia is another word. That means, would you be having an urge to declare the glory of God irrespective of the successes that you might see in your career or life. Let your success be a reason for you to show your God. You know why? There is a beautiful verse in the Bible. And children of God better be careful about this verse. That is Psalm 50 and verse number 4. Psalm 50 and the fourth verse. Very often we must have all read it many times. But probably just passed our minds. It says, the Lord will call the heavens above and the earth below to judge his faithful ones alone. The Lord will call the heavens above and the earth below only to judge his faithful people. That means for you and for me, children of God, he's going to call the heavens above. One day the heavens above will bring back every word that Saji Abraham spoke. 
and i didn't believe this so i went and i googled nasa like sister said search in google no so i went and searched about nasa and i said can i get my voice back and very clearly it shows there if my mummy wants to hear my first cry it can be made available today if the frequency of it is known and the technology is available that means one day the lord the master will bring back every word i spoke and it can be replayed back and this earth will give a testimony of who i am and you know how does the earth give a testimony then i see i go to the numbers chapter 12 when the holy spirit leads me to verse number 3 and there the lord gives a testimony you know of all the people that lived on the face of the earth moses was the most humble and then i said god how is moses most humble if anybody's got numbers 12 you can refer to that of all the people that lived on the face of the earth moses was the most humble or the most gentle how many of you agree to that i don't agree don't you know that he killed an egyptian moses killed the egyptian and yet the bible calls him he was the most humble of everybody that walked the face of the earth dear brothers and sisters that was proof enough for me that the lord can forget your past like never before he can forget your past don't brood over it brother this earth can never testify your past if you're washed by the blood of christ and stand for his glory your past is a gone by story it doesn't matter anymore and this earth will not testify one day when he calls the heavens above and the earth below to testify there will be a different testimony about you not what you had and not what you know my dear brothers and sisters it might linger in your mind but god has erased it from the book of life it's not there So this afternoon as professionals God has placed in different organizations in different capacities I want you to know forget your past and get moving for the glory of God never think about what culture can throw at you never be worried about what the society might think about you stand there for Jesus and when you do that you will see him leading you through there is no peer pressure there is no hierarchical pressure that can stop you if you really would dedicate and submit to the Lord that's why I said one word in the beginning if you really listen well it says holy spirit will you be more real than my real reality every morning that's the prayer i pray father god please be more real than my reality that one prayer is enough to sustain you irrespective of the culture of your workplace dear brother sister so you don't have to attend parties with your bosses to get shortcuts done all you got to do is say holy spirit come and have a party in my life that's all that matters holy spirit take control of my reality and that's all that matters lord and that will take you and me to different places would you like to be that disruptive leader and christians in the workplace we have a role to play disruptive leadership and that's our call you're not like the other people you got to be somebody different and the difference is not in your arrogance not in your authority disruptive leadership is something where in your humility in your gentleness that you show people around you who your lord is and that god will lead you forward you know the bible says in the book of titus chapter 3 and verse number 2 i would request one of you to please read that the book of titus chapter number 3 and verse number 2 these are chapters or verses that we never never read because in many people's bible titus will be stuck together you have to do that surgery today to do that open heart surgery to get those pages apart titus chapter 3 and verse number 2 can somebody read that please it's a very 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 terrible verse that's why i want you to read it it's nice but titus 3:2 they must not slander how many people <laughs> anyone and must avoid have we all done that yeah yeah we are all holy holy people okay no show true humility to everybody my dear brother sister this is our call that is called disruptive leadership to be no quarrelers to slander nobody but to be gentle to everybody which is an impossible character for a default human being's nature but god is expecting you and me to be clothed with this kind of a nature in the workplace so that you quarrel with nobody you're not a slanderer you don't belong to that party and you are gentle to everybody in that workplace however big the authority i mean adorning you could be that's what god expects from you and from me my dear brothers and sisters can we be such people in the kingdom work that god has placed us in because a day will come when you're answering your god one day he will say i gave you this position this authority how did you treat your team were you gentle were you somebody who treated everybody with respect and you knew that they were better than you i mean if you didn't do that if authority and position took over that character trait that god expects from you according to titus 32 and according to ephesians 2:10 and you are his workmanship this better show 
Dear brother, this afternoon, dear sister, this afternoon, this is the character that God expects from a child of God. And as a professional, as an executive, as a professional in a workplace, in a corporate strata, where God has placed you, the world has a different attitude. A child of God can align with that, but with a very different attitude. And that's what God wants us to do. That is called workmanship managers or a disruptive leader who can actually portray Christ in the workplace. Now coming to the next slide, you know, welcome to a disruptive world. You are here in this room today. Welcome, my dear brother. Your point number one, disrupt your role. Point number two, disrupt your identity. Point number three, disrupt your meaning. And point number four, please start to disrupt your leadership from today. Whatever position God has placed you, disrupt your role means you are no more there to boss over. You are a facilitator. You're no more there to find fault with somebody else. You're there to provide a helping hand to enable that person. You're no more there to see, feel that you're bigger than somebody. You're there to say that somebody else is bigger than me. That's disrupting your role, brother. Disrupting your identity means the very position that God has placed me in. Can people look at me differently? I don't wait for appreciations of people, but let me rather wait for people to be appreciated by me. And that is disrupting identity. Tell them a good word or two. It doesn't matter how bad he or she is. You can make the difference by disrupting your identity, brother. If you don't have that identity till today, please put it on today. Number three, disrupt your meaning. The very person of who you are. Tell your name and look at yourself and be a different person. And that's what God wants you and me to be. And start disrupting your role from today. My dear brothers and sisters, Christian managers in the workplace have to be disruptive. As Jesus was disruptive. If 12 disciples of Jesus can take the gospel across the globe today that we even carry on preaching. If the 12 guys could do such a great job, how many of us can do much greater if only we can be the disruptive leaders in the hands of God the way that he wants us to be. My dear brothers and sisters, it is a possibility that God has given us. But the negativity is that we are not willing to be the person that God wants us to be. We need to change in our mental attitude, in our thinking, in our submission before God. Disruption is either going to happen to you or it's going to be because of you. Which side of the coin would you like to be? Either you get disrupted and say, oh my dear brother, I'm praying, it's not happening. I love to do this, but some of something is being blocked. I mean, that means you're a disrupted person. God help you. But if that disruption in the workplace can happen because of you, that would be the testimony of a child of God. This is told by some normal person, Brian Solis. I don't know who he is. If somebody knows here, fine. I don't know who he is, but beautiful statement there. Disruption can happen either because of you or it can happen to you. My dear Christian brothers and sisters, Bangalore needs disruptive leaders who can create disruption in the way that the glory of their God is seen in the workplace. And that is the opportunity God has given you. Don't complain about the negativities in your workplace. Don't complain about the culture in your workplace. You have been ordained by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. And that's why God gives you something special which many others do not have. That's why you have testimonies to encourage you. That's why you have the word of God to lean upon. That's why you have a time of prayer. That's why you have a church. That's why you have a fellowship. You have a backup of people praying for you. That means you've got to be different, brother. You've got to have a life with a difference. Thank you, I got 10 minutes more. Disruptive leadership. <laughs> this particular slide that you see, see I've, I've mentioned no caption out there. But the thing is, would you be ready to climb that mountain top without knowing what's on top? Don't expect great things. You know, Job in his, the book of Job, chapter 42, verse number 5, he says, Lord, till now with my ears I heard about you, but right now my eyes have seen you. You know, for a man like Job, whom God himself testified to Satan, did you see my child Job? He's the most faithful. That most faithful man says, God, I only heard about you till I lost my wife, I lost my children, I lost all my property, and I was on the roadside, Lord, where the street dogs are licking my wounds, and then I got to see you, my God. Dear brothers and sisters, it's good to lose something in life if it means that experience can show you who your God is. It's worthy. It's worth to lose something sometimes to know who your God is. Don't hold on to that so-called blessings. You might, they may blind you from seeing you who your God is. Let's hold on. If, I, if Job chapter 42 verse 5, you can go home and read because I don't have much time before me. Always please look beyond what you can see. Never look at what you see in front of you. Look at what purpose God might have through it. My dear brothers and my dear sisters, the failure of the Peter catching fishes that night 
was something that God looked beyond. God did not want him to get a fish. God wanted him to have an abundance of fishes. But the ultimate aim of God was that this man's got to leave everything and follow me. That's what God wanted and he got it accomplished. My dear brother, sister, to you it might look at a one day's failure for Peter. To me, it looked like a great success because the master came there and provided everything. But to God's vision, it looked like, I will make you fishers of men, men, Peter. Leave this net and board and come after me. I'm calling you for something different. Dearest brothers and sisters, seated on the corporate ladder, seated in positions of authority and influence, you are called in that place to be fishers of men for the kingdom. That's why that role and that salary and that designation. Would you really surrender that before God to say, Father God, let me be a fisher of men in that place that you kept me, Lord. Not looking at the glory of that corporate positioning or that company strata, Lord, where I am in. But Father, rather to look at where you've kept me and what you would like me to do in that place. Because the other people there don't know what I know. And Father God, use me for your glory that their lives may be touched. And that should be the yearning with which we stand in God's presence. Because the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. That means from today, think like a conqueror, speak like a conqueror, walk like a conqueror, because you are a conqueror. Christian child of God, you're not a failure. My dear child who knows Christ, you're not an unwanted person. But let me tell you, most of us in this room today, we are found wanting in doing what God wants us to be done in our workplace. Somewhere or the other we have failed and there is a gap. And God wants you to fill that gap today. For which a change of mindset, a change of attitude in us is necessary. And God can use you for his glory. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah 40, 30 and 31. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord. I believe this room, everybody who is here. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. You know, when you see this verse and when you look at that comparison to an eagle. I just want to ask you a question. You know, eagle is the bird that can fly the highest. We know that. There's no other bird that can overtake an eagle in terms of elevation of flying. So my question to you is, if an eagle is flying at the highest order, which is the only other bird that an eagle can see? It has to be another eagle, right? You cannot see somebody else. That means when you rise up the corporate ladder, when God raises you up, and when you become a child of God, there can be lonely moments. You will never see many people around you. Your life can get lonely, but that's leadership, brother. That's leadership. Jesus had lonely times, and that's why he went up to the mountain to pray alone. And the disciples could not even stay for one hour with him. And he came and asked, can't you pray for one hour with me? They cannot. Dear brother, sister, when you stand for God in your company, you'll be lonely. You'll be sidelined. You'll be pushed away. Those are signs of God's grace working upon you. Hallelujah. Those are not signs of rejection. And I want you to take that as a litmus test. When you are rejected, when you're unwanted, when people group against you and when they don't include you, and when you find that you're rejected, just be happy. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, my dear brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of various kinds. If you are a person who can accept that reality in life, you know, God can use you in your workplace. If you're a person who would complain when that happens, God can never use you. You'll be a failure. And I'm talking this from my life's experience and I know what it is. There was a day when I was in Geneva, standing at the United Nations Center and speaking on behalf of India. And that's why today I have the honorary responsibility on advising UN on corporate social responsibility. My dear brothers and sisters, nobody knows this, but I'm sharing this on this forum because the Holy Spirit wants me to. You and I have a calling which is so unique. It is not to be advertised to the world outside, but you stand for the glory of your God. And let me tell you, that's the greatness. It's not who you are. It's not what all you have. It doesn't matter, brother. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse number 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, thereby bringing glory to God the Father through him. Whatever word you speak, whatever deed you do, do it in the name of Jesus. Are you that person? Are you that manager? Are you that leader? Does every word of your count in the name of Jesus? Can you look back and say from January 1st, 2022 to this day, 20th of August, every word of mine has been spoken through the name of Jesus to bring glory to God the Father. I know none of us sitting in this room can claim to have done that. I know that none of us can claim to have every deed done in the name of Jesus, but God has placed you in a position and a place where he expects that unique character out of you. 
And that's why you're his workmanship. He said, I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. He said, not even a hair will fall without my permission. He who touches you, touches the apple of my, is what he, my eye, is what he said. If he said that, that pertains to you, my dear brother, my dear sister. You who do the will of God as father are supposed to be his brother, sister, and mother. If that's the way God looks at you, is there a difference in the way that you look back at your God? He's not just there to provide a solution to your problems. He's not just there to give you some escape route. I mean, your God is not a God of escape route. Yeah. Your God is a God who will raise the fire seven times and let you walk. Hallelujah. That's the God you serve. We Christians don't have a God who gives escape routes. He pushes you into the fire, literally. And we need to be ready to take that. That's the call of God. That's why you need this God. Otherwise, you could have had any other ordinary God. And you got a God who's different. So you got to be different as well. And that's the call of the Holy Spirit to you and to me today. Christians in the workplace, you can churn the city inside out. Christians in the workplace, Bangalore can see Jesus. Instead of all the culture that you have around today of entertainment and all other kind of unwanted things. Bangalore can see Jesus the way like they never saw before. Provided you are ready to submit into the presence of God. And that is categorically clear and specific that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about it. And you got to take that role on. Put on the armor of God. Take your profession seriously and look at your God and say, I am available, Father. Use me for your glory. Tell me what I should be doing differently. And when you look at this, I'm sure all your eyes will go to that blue duck. <laughs> but unfortunately, most of us are the yellow ducks here today inside this room. God wants you to be a blue duck. You know who the blue ducks in the Bible are? The David, the Joseph, the Moses, the Daniel, and the likes of them. And one thing that I would like to ask you before I conclude and come to my last slide to say thank you is, if you can list on that slide the name of David, the name of Joseph, the name of Abraham, the name of Daniel, below that, can you put your name in that same list? If you can do that, brother, sister, you respect, honor, and give glory to God with the way that he has blessed you. If you cannot, don't even aspire to be in the place that they are in. It can just be a dream. Because the Bible says in Matthew 7 and verse number 21, Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will ever enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Just because I'm a Christian, just because I go to church, just because I read the Bible, just because I can speak in tongues, I will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Very clear, Matthew 7, 21, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you've got to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be somebody who does the will of the Father. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart. Why are they blessed? Because they will see God. Unless you have a pure heart, unless you have a clean heart, Saji Abraham, you can preach well, you will never see your God. And if I don't see my God, I'm not a blessed person. That's what the Bible tells me. And this afternoon, my dearest brothers and sisters, as we conclude this session today, only one message that the Holy Spirit wants to leave with you is, look at your role differently from today. Look at the calling upon you as something very different. The colleagues around you are the ones for whom you are accountable before God one day. Remember that. God plays you in that organization, in that company, in that team, in that particular positioning, so that you would be an influential factor before those people with whom you are connected, that they will see Jesus because of you. You are that somebody that Jesus put there. And you're going to be accountable for the role that you have right now. It's enough of the great salary counting. It's enough of the great designation and blogging that we do. It's enough talking great about all those that we've achieved in our life. Can we start telling God how many souls can I bring to you because of wherever you put me in? And God, I know one day I'll be accountable because he says I will come like a thief. Blessed is the one who keeps his clothes and stays awake. My dear brother, sister, can we be the people whom he will find staying awake? Can we be the blue ducks that he can account with Abraham and Joseph and Daniel? Can we be those people very special that Bangalore doesn't have? Today, Bangalore needs some blue ducks. And God needs those blue ducks in Bangalore. Would you love to be that blue duck and put on that role? That's the call of God into your life today. Submit into the presence of God and may God bless you. With this, I would like to conclude this session. Shall we all bow our heads and close with a word of prayer? Our loving God and our Heavenly Father, we love you so much, Father, for giving us this day. Thank you for this opportunity that all of us could together come and stay in your presence. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that was imparted to us. Enable us to look at our roles, our professions, Lord, the responsibilities that you have placed on us in such a manner that we'd be facilitators of somebody else to see your love, that we would reflect the radiance of your glory in our workplaces, Lord, in the society that we live in, Master.
grant us the grace of gentleness grant us the grace of humility grant us the grace of lord being humble before people lord to consider somebody else better than me and father god to honor you through doing that let this day be a day of blessing to every brother sister seated in this room today father i thank you for the church and the organization and the committee that put this meeting together lord we give you glory may your name be glorified father i declare in jesus name that every individual here will be blessed to such an extent that they would one day be found to be a reason for impacting bangalore for the glory of god that one day when you open the books in heaven on the day of judgment you will call out to each one of us and say well done my good and faithful servant and father together as the same team that we are here today that we will be found standing before your throne wishing one another and giving you all the glory. glory impart to us this mercy today thank you for your grace through which you spoke to us we humble ourselves before your awesome presence lord in jesus most precious and wonderful name we pray amen 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 god bless you all have a wonderful walk with christ thank you very much.